Hi, this is Shirley Halper, an executive editor of Variety. You're listening to Your Morning Coffee, the podcast with my friends Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchart. Weekly music news for the new music business. From Ted Joya, how short will songs get? From Billboard, Megan Thee Stallion's bitter fight with her label, explained by the lawyers from both sides. And from Variety, how did the FN Mecca mess happen? Well, we will cover all of these things, Jay. We got a lot to talk about today, and oh my goodness, I can hardly wait to get going. So, but get going, we shall. So, everyone, kick back and relax because Jay and I are about to hit the start button right about now. Stand by for transmission. This is London Calling. Wake up! The revolution is at hand! Your morning coffee is on the air. Your morning coffee, the weekly music news for the new music business. It's the highly curated, agitated, advocated, moderated, and liberated digital music information that you need to know. We are your digital music authority. And now from our studios in Hollywood, California, here's your hosts, Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchart. Jay, here we are. Good to see you, brother. I saw you Good yesterday. You. I saw yeah. you yesterday. It was a rare occurrence for us, which is we actually see each other in person out in the wild. And yeah, that was cool. Lovely. We yeah. we had a nice lunch with uh, Shirley Halperin from, did. Uh, from Variety. She's the executive editor of music over at Variety, but she's much more than that. Um, she's also just a wonderful person, and we just had such a great time uh, having lunch with uh, Shirley yesterday. And, and her eggs Benedict dish looked really good. I kept looking. I go, ooh, I might get that next time. <laughs> it was really good. <laughs> we all had breakfast at yeah one o'clock. It was lovely. It was great. Yeah. And and as you and I talk about so frequently, um, a variety on in terms of music coverage has really become such especially for us a go-to source. Yeah. I mean they have just they are just really They're killing it. it out of the park. Absolutely. Yeah, one of the one of the leaders in the space. Um, in fact, we're covering one of their pieces uh, today, um, which is not unusual for us. Yeah, exactly. So it's uh it's it's really like you said it's it's such a go-to uh, resource and reference for us in all sort of the verticals that they cover and you know I th- I think I mentioned it at lunch I for a brief period of time I owned a newsstand um, and so I would see you know every magazine and I so I remember Daily Variety this was probably 15 years ago when I did a newsstand briefly um, and it's it's a dramatic difference uh, in terms of what they cover and and how deep they go and and it's like I said, especially in the music side, it's so fantastic now. It was yeah. one of our go-to resources with that. Yeah, she gave so. you a copy of the physical she magazine. She did, yes. Um, which last time I met her uh, for lunch, she she gave me one. And I don't see magazines as often as I'd like. I'm such a big magazine oh, junkie. We are and both. it is large. It is printed on the highest quality yeah. you know, paper. It's a... It's a class act. Right. And by the way, the other funny thing, uh, chatting with her, was uh, her stories about working at High Times, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, her first gig in the publishing world. <laughs> and, and uh, oh, my gosh, we was, it was a fun lunch slash breakfast. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, good times. Good and times. And thank, thank you, Shirley, for the, uh, for the intro. We really appreciate it. Yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, well, Jay, when we start the show, we have to, of course, talk about our sponsors because uh, we are so lucky. We've been doing this show for, this is episode, Episode 107, yeah. uh, 
And we've had just lovely sponsors all along the way, and we are the so best. blessed and, and appreciative of that. Uh, Your Morning Coffee podcast is brought to you by our friends at Banzoogle, built by musicians for musicians. Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform that makes it easy to build a beautiful website and EPK for your music. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in. Hosting a custom domain name, hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free, commission-free crowdfunding and fan subscription features, mailing list tools to grow your fan list and send newsletters, as well as social media integrations and live support from their musician-friendly team seven days a week. And by the way, this whole support thing, that is so important to have yeah. folks you can reach out to when you need the help. So your Morning yep. Coffee podcast listeners can go to Banzoogle.com to try it free for 30 days and use the promo code Morning Coffee, all one word, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. That's Banzoogle.com, promo code Morning Coffee. Yeah, your Morning Coffee podcast is also brought to you by our friends over at HypeBot. Since 2004, HypeBot has chronicled the new music business and the trends and technologies that are changing how music is discovered, consumed, marketed, and monetized. Edited daily by founder Bruce Houghton with help from Alana Bonilla, HypeBot and sister blog Music Think Tank are published by live music discovery and marketing platform Bands in Town, and speaking of Bands in Town, over 65 million live music fans trust Bands in Town to get personalized concert alerts, recommendations, and messages from their favorite artists. It's the number one artist services platform connecting over 550,000 artists with their super fans. Managers, labels, agencies, and artists access their own dashboard to manage and promote their tour dates across all platforms. Yes, indeed. Big thanks to everyone. We really appreciate it. And of course, the guy that I chat with every week and then occasional brunch lunches is none other than <laughs> Jay Gilbert. He is the co-founder of music marketing and strategy company Label Logic. He's the curator of the Your Morning Coffee newsletter, which we all read and love, and a former executive with Universal, Sony, and Warner Music Groups and Fox Home Entertainment, and a guy who, you know what? Looks pretty good in a Speedo, I'll be honest. So. <laughs> oh, my God. Nobody wants to see that. And this guy sitting across from me with a good sense of humor is long, uh, Mike Etchart, longtime host of Sound and Vision Radio, formerly of SST Records, Warner Music, which we're going to talk about in a second, Capital mm -hmm. EMI, and Universal Music Groups. So since I just kind of teed that up, yeah, we, we teased it last week, but this is kind of our quote-unquote book club um, you and I uh, just read a really good book um, called Sonic Boom, The Impossible Rise of Warner Brothers Records from Hendrix to Fleetwood Mac to Madonna to Prince. That's a long cover. Or, yes, it uh, is. Long title, title. Written by Peter Ames Carlin. And uh, I'll let you kick it off. Um, you were the one that kind of uh, told me about this book. And, you know, there have been other books about Warner Music. You know, Stan Cornyn's book is really great, Exploding. There's, there's some other books. But this was, uh, this was kind of a cool uh, dive into the rise and fall of Warner Music Group. Yeah. And, you know, time and time again, we are reminded at, at how hard it is to build something. Um, but how easy it is to destroy something yeah. or just take it apart. And I think what, you know, I, you know, I, and it was interesting, you know, for me to read it, um, cause I was there from roughly, well, I worked for the Warner music group as a group from 80, uh, 89 through 96. Um, but I was at Warner Brothers Records for two years, from 89, 90, and 91. And so lots of people in the book I worked with and, and interfaced with. And it, so it's first of all, it's just fun to, to read those stories. But like whenever you're in an organization, um, they do a terrible job of, of giving you corporate history or, or tell the really story of how we got to where we are. And one of the things I really appreciate about this book is, you know, I knew I heard stories working there and you, you knew names, people that kind of preceded you, but I didn't know the full story. And so right. what I really found about about the book that, that really was was great was it filled in all the blanks for me going back to the beginning. And yeah. so it's love that. And then I think what I think what I think. <sighs> stumbling here on the words what what I really think made the book great was that ultimately the writer got to chat with Mo Austin the longtime yeah. chairman who just passed and away. I had heard he doesn't do a lot of interviews absolutely not you know he historically always you know he did not want to be in the in the news he wanted his artists to be in the news and yeah. that's one of the themes throughout the whole book but at the very end it mentions that he he, he did a, a, a short interview with Mo 
um, that was off the record. And then eventually um, he had a very long sit down and, and it was yeah. filmed and uh, it was for 20 hours, they said. And so I think that really informed all the detail in the book. Those That's just my guessing. Um, and, and it's, again, fascinating if you if you know the brief story, which is, uh, you know, he was essentially forced out. And uh, it was when Steve Ross, the head of, of Warner Brothers, uh, died then a lot of uh, folks came in that didn't like the way the record companies were being run. They were had so much latitude, and they were so profitable. But that's why they were so successful, and is that's why they, they were had successful. that yes. latitude. And from day one, it was about, you know, great music. It mm-hmm. wasn't about chasing a one-hit wonder. And he gave his executives, Mo Austin did, uh, the power to to do that. And it's just an amazing part of music business history. And, you know, there, I'd heard for years that this executive, Robert uh, Morgado, Morgado took, yeah. took the greatest company in music, music history, and basically burned it to the ground because he thought some of these executives like Mo had too much power. And, and Mo up until that point had answered directly uh, to Ross yes. and he, you know, didn't like that. And it's just amazing when, you hear of all the artists that they signed and broke and it's and nurtured and yeah. nurtured that's the real thing that's that's interesting about it and they they really believed in artistry and they recognized that sometimes great artists will never sell a lot but you also attract other artists when you have that and so they talked a lot about you know the Grateful Dead in fact when we, when we were with Shirley Shirley's a big Grateful Dead fan and we were talking about you know those first few albums did not sell they stuck with them every other label would have punted and they they stuck with them and 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 of course, they did finally break, and um, that investment had paid so much over over the years. And those, and we've talked about on this program so many times about how important catalog is to to still to the to the industry, whether it's streaming or physical. And um, those those investments that those executives made back in the late '60s into the '70s that a lot of people would not have stuck with. They oh paid off multiple dividends. Well, let's and- let's talk about a few of these because, you know, if you read kind of the intro for the book, it, it says a roster of Warner Brothers records and its subsidiary labels reads like a roster of Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, right? Yeah. Jimi Hendrix, Grateful Dead, Joni Mitchell, Neil Young, James Taylor, Fleetwood Mac, Eagles, Prince, Van Halen, Madonna, Tom Petty, R.E.M. I mean, the list just goes on and on. It is just stunning the quality of the artists that they were able to sign and break. And they had a lot of artists, you know, they talk about Van Dyke Parks at the beginning, Mm -hmm. who is just, you know, he's like Brian Wilson. He's like this mastermind. And maybe he didn't have that breakout uh, career like some of these other artists, but he certainly helped, you know, participate in that. And I was fortunate enough, you know, I didn't, get to work with a lot of those key executives that they talk about. But I, you know, I met Mo Austin a couple of times. Um, I had a couple of breakfasts, you know, um, with Jack Holtzman, you know, who Mm -hmm. they talk about in the book. Electra records, yeah. Yeah, Electra. And then he was really one of the first guys into technology. Very much Um, so. And and before that, video, before video was a thing, Jack's always been on the cutting edge of those things. And I had launched a digital only label at Universal in 2004 and I think it was 2004 and uh, I met with Jack and we had uh, breakfast and talked uh, over those things and later he launched a digital label called Cordless. Um, which was pretty cool. Uh, my friend Jason Fiber uh, mm-hmm. ran that. I remember. And it was that. just kind of a cool time because it was new. Right now, there's lots of digital labels, but at the time, there wasn't. And uh, so it was kind of cool to interact with someone who I felt like was this icon, you know, in in the music industry. Yeah. And and reading this book, it just reminded me of a different time when you could develop an artist over time. You could have two or three albums before an artist would hit and people were patient. Today, there's a lot of deals that are singles. You have X amount of singles, you know, focus tracks before we'll make the decision to give you a bigger advance and sign you for an album. Right. And it's such a singles based economy these days. It's just a whole different world. Yeah. Well, and a couple of the things, a couple of the stories that were mentioned in the book, uh, uh, 
uh, I actually was was observing from afar at the time because I was still in the building. And the, they tell the story in the book about the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and their deal was ending with EMI. So they were free agents, and lots of labels were chasing them. And they came into Warner Brothers. I remember seeing them come in that day, and they met with Mo, and um, and Lenny Warnker, who was the president, and a couple of other folks. And uh, it turns out, as the book mentioned, that um, uh, Epic uh, had a, an, a higher offer. And so they really, they really liked the vibe at Warner's, but the money was just too good over at Epic. So they went over there, and and uh, what happened after they made their decision, uh, as the book mentioned, Mo Austin called each one of the members individually, and at said, home. "Hey, yeah, at home," and said, "Hey, I'm sorry it didn't work out, but uh, you know maybe sometime down the road something will happen." But just wanted to say, <laughs> I wish you guys the best of luck. So and cool. uh, congratulations on on your, on your deal and uh, and best of luck. Well, they get over to Epic as they're about to sign, and then so- suddenly things are changing a little bit, and the deal isn't the deal that they really thought it was, and they decided to come back. And so, you know, maybe those four phone calls, maybe they would have stuck it out had those phone phone calls not happened. I don't, you don't ever know, but you know that personal touch it was so important. And then the other thing they mentioned was. Uh, you know, the, a, a fan of the of the label, uh, a kid in his bedroom. They talk about looking at all those records that came out and recognizing that a lot of his favorite records were on Warner Brothers or Reprise. Uh, that kid's name was Peter Buck, and of course, he started a band called REM. And when they were free agents after their IRS deal uh, ended, they want they knew one place they wanted to go to, yeah. and that was Warner Brothers Records. And yeah. again, though you know that those were decisions that were the artists that were signed in the '60s. This kid saw them. Peter Buck saw them, and decades later, he came over and would. It's just it's building that empire, which is yeah. slow, and pa- you have to be patient. And again, in in that in that scenario, um, Steve Ross protected those record labels, Atlantic, right. Atlantic, Electra, and Warner Brothers. And right. you need that. You need that vision, but you also need that protection. And so just don't when, when it all melted down, a lot of those executives went over to Universal, mm-hmm. uh, where I worked. And I got to work for Henry Droz. Yeah. And Henry, if, you'll re- if you read the book, you'll see that you know back in the day, they had all these indie distributors, the, the majors didn't really have their own distribution. They used these, this other structure. Regional, regional independent record That's distributors. Right. And Henry thought, no, we need to have our own branches in these markets and our own production so we're not beholden to other people. If we need 10,000 units of something right away, you know, we can uh, you know, maintain our own uh, stock and control our own destiny. And... That was one of the only things in this book that I thought was missing was the huge role that Henry Droz played. And when he and Jim Urie came over to Universal, they brought a lot of that mentality with them. Jim Urie used to work for Clive Davis. Mm -hmm. So I reported to uh, Jim and Henry, and they brought over this, this new mentality, and they had this slogan printed up, we stand for artistry and artist development. And it was just kind of this new mindset. And it was just an amazing time, an amazing time of growth. Um, because when I started with Universal, um, they were in last place uh, with the majors. When I left, they were in first place. Yeah. And it wasn't because of me. It was because of people like Henry Droz and Jim Yuri and Bob Schneiders and some of those guys that really took it to, to a new level. So... For our first kind of book club, we, we highly recommend uh, Sonic Boom uh, by Peter Ames Carlin. What a, what a great read. Oh, it's a great read. And it's just, and it's so tragic. <laughs> I mean, it's, like I said, easy to build. I'm sorry, hard to build and time yes. consuming, easy to, easy to destroy. And that's really yeah. what, what that book is about as well. I mean, yeah. It's the, the good times and then the, the, the kind of sad way that it ends but uh, great yeah. stuff really really yeah. worth reading so all right well let's jump into it because and by the way that informs some of the things we're going to talk about it's like oh my god i mean just when you after reading the book and you hear about these wonderful long-term artist development plans and <clears throat> patience and this that and the other thing then we're well, going to talk to about that point mike before we yeah. jump into this ted sure. joya piece which is amazing um i had the pleasure of meeting up with jonathan daniel this week and oh, yeah. uh you know, if you don't know Jonathan Daniel or who he is, he runs Crush Management and, you know, Panic at the Disco, Green Day, Fallout Boy, Miley Cyrus, Sia, 
you know, the list goes on and on. Anybody and on. I've heard of? Exactly. <laughs> As you would like to um, say. Yeah, it's it's just such an amazing company. I first became aware of Jonathan when I was working at Tower Records. I was putting away some albums and I saw this really cool album cover with these guys that looked like the Beatles and, you know, uh, the, I don't know. It, it was really cool. The band was called Candy. And later I learned that Gilby Clark was in that band and Kyle Vincent and uh, and Jonathan Daniel. And uh, I got to know Kyle over the years, and he did a couple of my living room shows. Amazing, amazing performer. Um, got to meet Gilby when he was in Guns N' Roses. And, you know, just kind of uh, watched from afar as Jonathan and his team built this amazing management company. But it's all about uh, artist development. And he started doing things that a couple of pioneers in management did, you know, people like Howard Kaufman and Irving Azoff, where they started taking some of the roles and responsibilities that labels used to be responsible for, and they would do those. And they were controlling their own destiny. So Mm -hmm. they became almost a little bit like a label in some regards. They were handling some of those things. And... So I had communicated with Jonathan, you know, he had done a coffee talk for your morning coffee and, you know, we, we didn't certainly know each other, but I met him at his office and we just had an amazing conversation about artist development, about what's going on in the music industry, about, you know, everything. We both, we both, just like you and I, we have a lot of the same uh, favorite bands. Um, We're roughly the same age and, um, it was just uh, the highlight of my week, um, one of the many highlights of my week. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that because you were about to get into, you know, it's it's a whole new music business, and for managers now, it's it's a different world. And, uh, well, and it's really cool. it, like you said, it, you know, they they need to take it in. I mean, they they are representing an artist, and they want that artist to be successful. And if somebody is dropping the ball along the line, you're going to need to somehow pick it up and. Like you said, they, they are controlling so much about entertainment and art and development is um, is basically being responsible and making sure you do the right things. And it's hard work and yeah. it's easy to get screwed up. And th- this is this is the new music business, truly, which is yeah. the, the, the power of management and right. how they can really, really do a lot of those things. Because labels, quite frankly, are dropping the ball. And I see this, I've mentioned this, um, I do work with publishing as well. It's the same thing in the book business. They, they are not doing, it's, it's, it's lots of things thrown against the wall. And, see, and once yeah. something is clicking, then they rush in and, and, and provide financing and, and do the things that we used to kind of do up front. Yeah. Um, and I'm unfortunately, I see that still with labels and yeah. like, I totally understand why man, well, why, by right. managers want to take, take, take control. Yeah. You, you and I, you know, we don't bash labels because there's so many great uh, labels out there doing great work, but not all of them are, but I can tell you that uh, a manager like Jonathan Daniel understands all the different things that are going on in the music yeah. industry across the board. And you know, we work with some managers who have a strength in in touring, for example, but mm-hmm. they surround themselves with smart people who know about these other things. But Jonathan, even though he's not, you know, the young kid in candy anymore, he still is curious like we are and wants to know what's going on. And he's like some of these young managers that we meet that it's this new breed. They understand, you know, web three, they understand, you know, targeted online ads. They understand the economics of streaming. They understand a lot of these things because they educate themselves. And there's nothing wrong with being an old school manager who has one strength, as long as you're aware of that and you bring in people who know what they're doing. Um, But I was so impressed uh, with, uh, with Jonathan and, uh, you know, it's um, a hard job. Ooh, it's a hard job. You know, it's not, not only one that I, I would want, it's a lifestyle. No, yeah. And you are, it's, you know, not only are you managing the, the efforts of, of a, gra- a group, but you're managing the personalities of the group and you're managing it's, you know, and we, we played in bands as kids and it's, it's like being married to three or four other people. And it is, there's just that thing is hard to manage for a manager to say nothing of all of the activities of, of yeah. promoting music and all that stuff. So that is a, that is a 24 seven gig. Oh yeah. And Many boy. of my clients are artist managers and some of them, it's more like they're a therapist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or, absolutely. you know, uh, 
And there's, of course, all the business as well. So let's jump into that Ted Joya. We've covered Ted yeah. uh, before. We, we dig Ted. And he has this article uh, called How Short Will Songs Get? He says, we now have 30-second classical works and pop tunes you can sing in one breath. But is this really the future of music? And he kicks it off by talking about long-form journalism and comparing that to music. He says... There, there's even a revival of kind of this long form journalism instead of these bite sized chunks, you know, as writers migrate from newspapers to more freewheeling platforms like Substack. But what about quote unquote long form music? He said that he recently learned about a bizarre Spotify playlist that was curated by a listener who collected recommendations, you know, from Spotify and all the songs roughly had, they were about 45 seconds long and that they all sound alike. And I thought that was absolutely amazing. So I checked out that that playlist that he was talking about. And sure enough, you know, there's a lot of songs on there that were like 40 seconds long. And he talks about this kind of attention uh, deficit uh, that that we have today. Absolutely. Uh, as he says, he says, bite-sized formulaic songs are everywhere. And it's not just AI that's making them real flesh and flesh and blood musicians are composing in formats shorter than a New York minute. But here's the key point. Humans are increasingly writing these blink of an eye songs to please the algorithm. So he's, he's, I've never seen the phrase doom loop. He said, this is truly a doom loop. Musicians are rewarded <laughs> for servicing the algorithm, and the algorithm is designed to punish everything fresh or creative or different from the prevailing formulas. You might be able to mm. run a bureaucracy like this, but does it make sense for a nightclub or concert hall or record label? But, you know, it's... It's it's so interesting because the the if you look at the pop music world, you know if you back in the fifties and into the sixties, songs were very short, very sure. short, and then freeform radio came out, FM radio, and and suddenly the and then the album format, album, and, and, yeah, again yeah, we're talking about Warner Brothers Records and uh, the book we read, and and they talked about that a lot, you know how how suddenly artists were rewarded for epic pieces and for basically telling a story in an album format how wonderful yeah. that was yeah and now we're back heading back in the other direction and it's yeah like, it oh sounds like God. it i'm gonna steal that doom loop i think that's cool oh it's a great line um yeah. you know he does talk of, there's also he's got a couple of really interesting graphics in here he he shows the print circulation if you know anything about usa today that actually started as an it was first of all it was a national newspaper and then it also had much shorter articles uh, kind of meant for travelers way so you had a constant newspaper if you traveled and much shorter stories and he mentions so that that's how the form how that newspaper was started and uh, the circulation of of USA Today was like one and a half million back in 2013. It's down to 160,000 now. And it's yeah. also kind of the death of newspapers and magazines. And, and you and I have talked about how much we love magazines yeah. to get that deep, deep, deep story. Yeah, we talked that, to Shirley about it uh, yes, yesterday. We did. You know, he goes in, into this algorithm. He says that right now the algorithm wants short songs. And in contrast to previous commercial constraints that imposed a three or four minute limit, more or less, you know, on songs that hope to go viral, these new hit seeking missiles of music explode in just a few seconds. <laughs> songs have been getting shorter for quite some time, but recently durations have collapsed. So he puts together this chart that shows that in 2000, you know, it, it was roughly. 245 seconds, so just over four minutes in 2000, you know, the average song was right around four minutes, just over four minutes. But in 2020, it had dropped like a minute to, to three minutes. So I just looked online just you know, out of curiosity. I looked at Spotify's today, today's top hits, and you know, the average length was just over three minutes, which, you know, plays right to this chart that he had. And so I was looking through it, and I found one song um, by rapper Central C. He does a song called Doja, and it's a minute and 37 seconds long. That was, <laughs> that was the shortest one I found. And uh, I think you can guess what the longest song I found on today's top hits. Was Kate that? Bush. Oh, oh, of course. Right. Running up that hill over five minutes. Now, is it today's top hit? Well, yeah. I mean, what's old is new again, right? It's not always about discovery, as Will Page says. It's about rediscovery. 
And so that may have pushed the average up, you know, a little bit, but it's still right in line with this chart that, that he has on that. And you and I were talking before we hit record about uh, Diver Down um, by Van Halen. And I mm-hmm. remember there was a big uh, kerfuffle about that. Um, I was working at Rising Sun Records and Tapes in Salem, Oregon, and that was the last album I can remember that was released with an 8-track. So there's cassette, 8-track, oh. and vinyl on Van Halen's Diver Down. And that album was 31 minutes, 18 seconds. Um, that was That was pretty short. And there were some cover tunes on there, too. But it was yeah. still... Uh, considered an album. So yes. what do you think? I mean, I, I it's got to be partly this whole TikTok um, revolution, you know, yeah. where a minute may seem really long, you know, if you were listening to a minute on on TikTok, right? Um, yeah. In fact, he, he has another chart in here um, that talks about the anatomy of a viral song on TikTok, and it says that the average duration is 19.5 seconds. Gosh. He says, that's brutal. Nothing good in life should last only 19.5 seconds. He <laughs> said, and I mean nothing. Um, he says, I've written elsewhere why this approach is out of sync with how human beings respond to music. This is really interesting. He said, that leads me to believe that sooner or later, long-form music will enjoy a revival. He says, more, more on that below. But there's, a, there's little sign of that on the horizon right now. And he said, in yeah. the meantime, people with longer attention spans are probably doing what I do, namely focus more on genres where robots and downsizing directives have less influence such as jazz or classical music, or the rule-breaking corners of popular idioms. But I note with some alarm that even classical music has decided to put the squeeze on its offering, which is kind of Yes stunning. and no. Yeah, yes and, and no. And, and no, no one's right. going to switch genres just because of the length of the song. That, that seems a little silly to me. But, you know, he they talk about, well, he talks about Deutsche Grammophon, right? This really popular classical label, kind of the gold standard in classical music. And that, you know, the marketing staff at Deutsche Grammophon was proudly inviting website visitors to experience Beethoven, the piano sonatas in under 15 minutes. Now, I think overall people's attention spans are being reduced, but he makes a really valid point in here. And that is that it's it's cyclical. If anything in the music industry... You know, if it's taught me anything, it's that everything is sort of sick, cyclical. What's old is new again. And I agree with him. I think that we're going through a time now where, you know, it's an eight second canvas video and it's like this 15 second thing on reels or stories or whatever. But I feel like that's not enough. And I think people, as they get into a, a band, because you and I were talking earlier about some uh, new bands we've been getting into. Um, and of course, we're maybe not the focus group for that, but you want to enjoy more when you love something, not, Absolutely. not less. Not and, less. And I'd love for you to talk about something that you've mentioned several times, you know, on the podcast. And that is when you love a great song, when you find a oh. new song, what do you do? We both, both you and I do this. We, I do, I'll just play that damn song over and over and over. I mean, I just, I just want to, I just want to hear more of it. And, and, and even at the 10th listening, you're like, oh, I didn't notice that little bass line part there. That's really clever. You know, it's like you, you just kind of, I, I, you just want to, I mean, it's like that first love when you just, you just want to be with that person for, yeah. you just can't, you, that's all you think about. And it's the similar <laughs> it's way, but analogy one analogy or comparison. Yeah, but one like of the that. things that he, what's interesting about this, sorry, he says the accumulated evidence from neuroscience and biochemistry is that our bodies need more than a few seconds to respond to the trance inducing power of music. I love that line. Amen. E- even a three minute song is not, not enough, which is why listeners tend to play their favorite songs over and over in order to compensate for their short duration. From a purely biological point of view, a song of just a few seconds is a dud. And that explains in many ways, yeah. you know, and, and you and I talked also before, again, before we hit record about <clears throat> when we're playing in bands over the years, when a band is in sync and you are you it's like surfing you 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 are just you can feel everybody is on the same plateau or the same wavelength and that's that's better yeah really wavelength and there's nothing like it and it, it's just fantastic and that's the way music is when you're just in the moment oh it's yeah it's just fantastic you know, and you it can just... be a venue you know what's interesting I, I was listening to Shirley Halperin's podcast Strictly Business and she yeah. was interviewing Peter Shapiro and and talking about Wetlands this this club um 
in in New York that he was uh, booking talent for and how just the energy of the room and he would put together some odd pairings of artists that he knew would work well uh, together but you might not think about and just that energy in that room was palpable yeah and I I, I remember that you know from all the great shows that I've been to um, when you get that synergy and when you get that chemistry it's it's electric you can you can feel it yes and you can and, and also you can feel it when it's not you know when you can when you're when you're in a band or when you're watching a band or an artist you can tell when they're just or I can Bailing tell it I in. Or, or just out of sync, you know, because sometimes it just happens, you know, whatever, for whatever reason. So um, anyway, back yeah. to back to the article. Yeah. He says, so who wins this battle, the algorithm or the human organism? Big money is now getting wagered on the algorithm, but I'm not so sure that this is how the story ends. He says, my hunch yeah. is that a short attention span is an obstacle to musical enjoyment, not yeah. its source. It's like the difference between looking at the menu in a restaurant, which experts tell us ought to be a quick, easy process, and actually enjoying the meal. If you study yeah. the greatest restaurants, you realize that the menu is short, but the meals are long. I he like says, that. I, f- I love that. He says, I, fe- I fear the music business has gotten those two things confused, making the experience of enjoying the song too short, while creating a drawn-out process of scrolling through the menu to find it. Yeah, but I don't think the music industry is choosing no. this. I think no. the the young people who are most of the consumers of music, they're choosing these platforms, you know, like uh, you know, uh, TikTok, for example, that that has this. But again, uh, that doesn't mean that this is the way that the industry has to be. No. And we've been talking a lot about TikTok and TikTok music and becoming a label and a distributor and all of these things. But I I am hopeful that it, it, it will be cyclical and mm-hmm. the longer form uh, will come back. And, and, you know, Ted says the same thing. He goes, am I a fool to deny these trends? He says, time will tell. But right now, the ultra short tune is in ascendancy. You know, it's rising and, and, and most of the music business is running in lockstep to follow the trend, like we just mentioned. So in an age of algorithms, trends feed on themselves, repeating and repeating and repeating. That's obvious even to me, he says. So this was a really interesting piece. We've talked about, you know, just how songs have been getting shorter and shorter and it's the old adage, don't bore us, get to the chorus, yep. right? Like you, you would always have a radio mix in, uh, of songs, right? And now you're having these streaming mixes of, of songs. And it's, it's fascinating to watch, you know, and he talks about how Warner Music has these 30-second, you know, classical pieces and things that you seem you know, counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. Um, But let's, let's see how all of these things uh, play out. But that the, the one takeaway for me was that chart that just showed over the last 20 or so years, uh, a minute being shaved off, you know, the average duration of, uh, of a track. Yeah. Yeah. Well, fascinating stuff. It's, it's, and again, one of those things where you don't necessarily think about it or, or I don't think about it all the time, but when somebody points it out, you're like, yeah, you know when I look at my uh, my Shazam list of songs that I've just you know discovered and like, they are getting shorter. They really are getting shorter. So well, I'll just have to listen to it that many more times in a row. That's exactly right, I, and and I do and continue to do. Uh, the next story, Jay, is from Billboard, and this story came out actually after the newsletter was sent. But but uh, I know you you and uh, I ap- ap- applaud this. It's such an interesting story that it was worth talking about. It's in, but it will be in the newsletter next yeah. week for for folks to read it exactly. Um, this is Megan the Stallion's bitter fight with her label, explained by the lawyers from both sides. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Story. And you and I love hearing about music industry lawyers. There's always things to learn there that you may not get from the headlines. There were a lot of headlines about this story, Megan the Stallion and her fight with her label, but some of them were really inaccurate because they jump on one part of the battle yeah. and they amplify that and you miss out on some of the uh, details. So this was written by Bill Donahue and it's from Billboard Pro, and again, to your point, it did come out after uh, your morning coffee was sent out um, yesterday at 5 a.m., um, but we, we felt it was important enough to, to go over because 
as uh, Todd Snyder sings in in his wonderful song. Or no, it wasn't Todd Snyder. It was Ricky Warwick. There are three sides to every story: <laughs> yours, mine, and the truth. Sorry, Ricky. <laughs> and that's kind of what this is about. And I'll just kick it off with you know they they talk about the claims about a leaked album. Right and millions of unpaid uh, royalties. Uh, Megan Thee Stallion has been fighting this for a couple of years now with a record label, a 1501 Certified Entertainment, and it's getting really ugly. To understand where things stand, Billboard chatted with the lead attorneys, not together at the same time, uh, on both sides, and they didn't mince words, right? Uh, Megan Thee Stallion has long been at odds with the label over a record deal she calls unconscionable. But things heated up further this week when Megan filed a new complaint seeking more than $1 million in damages and suggesting that her label might have even leaked her recent album, uh, Traumazine. The two sides have already been battling in court for more than two years, but the attorneys for both sides, if that's any indicator, this fight isn't ending anytime soon. No. You know, what's interesting, too, is uh, or interesting to me uh I I knew this label, 1501 Certified Entertainment. Uh, I wasn't really familiar with that label. So I, thankfully, of course, you, we have Google. Um, <laughs> it, it does mention the owner it, it, later on in the article, Carl Crawford. Now, that's a fairly common name, Carl Crawford. Um, and so I looked it up. Well, Carl Crawford, he was a player for the Dodgers. He, he's a really good baseball player uh, who wound his career down and now is somehow in this. So I'm like, because I was looking up 1501 Entertainment and, and I, all I could see was like in Wikipedia, a picture of a baseball player. I'm like, that's weird. So, something must be screwed up, you know, with, with Wikipedia or something. Why am I looking at a, at a baseball listing? Anyway, so Interesting. Uh, somebody I'm very familiar with, Carl Crawford. But yes, it's... It is, and how many times have we seen this, by the way? Which is an artist signs their first label deal. Is it is it the most fair deal? Usually not. You know, it's not. But she's of course super super successful, so it's not surprising that. Yeah, but um, how does she get super super successful? I think there's two sides to this, right? One is that the label will claim, "Look, we invested in you. Um, yes. We we put our marketing and our relationships to work globally." Yep. And we, along with the artist and management, but they certainly served a big role in making her this mega star. And so if she hadn't been that successful, would there be a complaint about this record deal, which you assume that she signed and had an attorney look over at some point? But of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. If you become this big star, then you're like, well, wait a second. Yeah. You shouldn't be taking that big chunk of my revenue. And, you know, if you've been around major labels long enough, you know that usually what happens or what often happens is, especially when, once an artist slits their first album or second album, it becomes successful. The manager goes in and there's oftentimes renegotiations of, of deals. Um, yeah. Apparently what had happened with, with Megan is that, so she signed the original deal in 2018, but in 2019, she got a new management deal with Jay-Z's Rock Nation. So as she said, she got real lawyers. <laughs> who helped her see that the original Ouch. deal was crazy. Uh, now, not surprisingly, 1501, the label, strongly denies these allegations. And and Carl Crawford, the former baseball player, uh, discovered, developed, and as to your point, fully financed her early career and gave mm-hmm. her sustainability uh, more than... T- uh, and and. And sustained sort of, you know, artist development more than was typical for a new and unknown artist. The label says Megan and Rock Nation are merely using baseless litigation as a vehicle to escape a deal she no longer likes. Yeah. We yeah. see that every now and again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this isn't the first time we've we've heard a story like this. It, it just gets, you know, I wish they could sit down over a table and, and work things out, um, you know, without... Uh, this big fight, but that, you know, the fight really, you know, over, you know, whether she was unfairly blocking or being unfairly blocked from releasing music. Um, So like in in March, 2020, she sued and won a temporary restraining order from a judge allowing her to release her EP sugar in 2021. She won a similar order in the same case, green lighting the release of a remix of the BTS song butter, um, which she was the, the featured artist on. So, you know, there's all these countersuits and it just gets it just gets messy. But one of the things I wanted to touch on was this 
this uh, litigation about whether an album is an album. You right. Know, um, the label is saying, well, you signed a contract with us that described what an album is. And she released an album um, that was 21 songs, right? This is uh, the album Something for the Hotties. Um, 21 songs, and they claim it was 29 minutes of new music. And according to the contract, that didn't constitute uh, an album, right? Yes. So. I don't, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I didn't see the contract. But if you sign an agreement that this is what constitutes an album, then uh, you should be held to that. Yeah. Well, and this is something we've talked about a lot as well in the past, which is the kind of changing faces of releases. You know, how the album has changed. And then we, we talked about uh, the, the Ted Joya article on, on how, short, how things are getting shorter. But I think the most interesting thing, apparently, is that in her... And we've talked about in the past, you know, what is an album now? How many songs is it? Um, and apparently, though, in her deal, it calls out what an album is. And they are saying right. that's not according to the terms of the contract. Maybe it is an album to mo- for most people, but it's not according to this contract. And right. I think th- therein is... And yeah. we, we haven't seen the contract, so who, who yeah. can say? And one of the other things... What they're saying. Sorry, one of the other things she talks about is that the album that she turned in, uh, uh, Traumazine, that was leaked. And uh, in, in the new complaint, she says a leak came just days after she handed the album over to 1510. And that it forced her to release the album early to avoid lost earnings, lost chart position, and lost data. Crucial there. Now, the label flatly denies that. Um, And she, you know, to her credit, she hasn't come right out and said that the label did it. She just said, you know, that it was leaked after she turned it in uh, to the label. And, you know, not to take the label side on all of this, because, you know, again, there's three sides to every story. But it's counterintuitive to think that a label would want to leak uh, the album because that that would only hurt them. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I see the logic in in that leak. No, I I can't imagine why they would do that. But you know, when you're in, I mean, that's we've seen this in very public lawsuits, which is they kind of throw everything at the the whole kitchen sink and and start making some pretty wild claims. What's happening, though, in the months ahead, the case is going to move into discovery with depositions from all the key players. Uh, Both sides have filed motions over the past week seeking such depositions, Uh, though how and when the extent to which those sit-downs happen already being fiercely disputed, not surprising in in these sort of things. Um, But, uh, you know, it's... If, if I'm going to look at it at a crystal ball, because this has already happened, she had a lawsuit that was that was settled, you know, and and they will probably come to some sort of terms and she'll have a better contract. Yeah. But it's it's an ugly go along the way and lots of money spent on attorneys. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see business. how it plays out. It's it's so unfortunate um, that this has all had to happen. But uh, yep. we'll, we'll keep you posted on how it goes. Yes. And speaking of a mess, let's get to the last story. Oh, my, oh, my goodness. goodness. Uh, this is from Variety. It's how did the FN Mecca mess happen? Yeah, and written by uh, Jem Oswad, who we've, yes. we've covered so many of his his stories. Uh, stories are just so well researched and written. Um, great job with this, uh, Jem. Yeah. So the controversy. This is just to remind everybody. This is Capital signed and quickly dropped a virtual rapper. This virtual rapper, FN Mecca. Uh, used the N-word in, in its songs and was depicted in racially stereotypical scenarios and videos. It seems like, why would you sign an artist like that? Um, signed by Capital. Um, but uh, they but they did. And so this is kind of a breakdown of, of what happened. It's a, as Jem says, however, it's, it's yet another glaring result of the lack of diversity throughout the music industry, not just at Capital, not just at major, major companies, but everywhere. And that's kind of the, the point being that uh, there was this incident, but it really yeah. shines a light on the lack of diversity. Yes, in, a larger... A larger problem, for sure. Absolutely. At the the center of this particular issue is not just the the use of racial stereotypes, you know, by FN Mecca, um, which is a, you know, um, AI character, 
you know, artificial intelligence, which was created by the music company Factory Now. It's got more than 1 billion views and 10 million followers on TikTok alone, but also the issue of its ownership. Specifically, the character used the N-word, as you mentioned, in several releases, though you know, one song released and then withdrawn by Capitol. And an early video depicts a character being beaten by a white police officer in prison. And, and although the, the character was voiced and the music created by some black creators, Factory Now apparently has no black stakeholders who stand to profit from its use of black stereotypes. Yeah. Uh, it's just, oh, God, you're just reading this and it's like, ugh. I mean, the whole, the whole thing is just so such a bummer i don't know how to say it you know it's first of all we're talking about ai artists a uh but those mm-hmm. ai somehow they have 10 million followers on tiktok alone a billion views and then you bring in all of these other things i mean i just don't i mean it's just especially after reading the warner brothers book where you're talking about this loving nurturing of artists artists you know flesh and blood artists and then this so um one of the things that though of course was mentioned as uh, there was um uh, a posted on so- social media we find a, a fault uh, in the lack of awareness in how offensive this caricature is the activist organization industry blackout wrote mm-hmm. in an open letter uh, which also called for the donation of any funds expended by capital on the project to charity and the budgets of black artists on the label it is a direct insult to the black community and our culture an amalgamation of gross stereotypes, appropriative mannerisms that derive from black artists, complete with slurs infused in lyrics. And, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, so and to as, their credit, you know, Capital jumped in pretty quickly and, and they had an official statement that said, you know, we offer our deepest apologies to the black community for our insensitivity in signing this project without asking enough questions about equity and the creative process behind it. We thank those who have reached out to us with constructive feedback, like you just mm-hmm. mentioned, uh, in the past couple of days. Your input was invaluable as we came to the decision to end our association with the project, you know, so you know, how does this happen with uh, Capital, which is owned by Universal? And as Jem points out, you know, at first glance, the project's immediate appeal, you know, in the 2022 music industry is obvious. Hip hop, TikTok popularity, NFTs and gaming. Not only did FM Mecca have one billion views and 10 million followers on TikTok, it was a platform's ambassador for its first NFT drop. And, and I looked that up and the, the NFT that I saw on uh, I'm a member of um, Sherry Hu um, in her DAO. And uh, I looked it up in the database there, and it was like $127,000. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not nothing, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, there have been these lucrative, high-profile branding deals with Amazon and Microsoft's Xbox for FN Mecca. And, you know, that first capital release, a track called Florida Water, that was announced on August 14th. So this is pretty recent. And they announced it as the world's first AR artist to sign with a major label artist, influencer, and Web3 resident all in one. So, you know, they say that FN Mecca blurs the line between humans and computers. And and all of that is true. But I think, um, as Capital said, look, we didn't dig deep enough to see that who was creating this, this, um, this AI-generated, quote-unquote, artist, which is black, that there were black people behind it. Now, the company behind it claims that they have a very diverse team. On the other side, they're claiming that they really only had you know one person of color. Um, I'm not really sure that matters as much as the fact that it just wasn't really well thought out. Right. Uh, as Jim points out, sources close to the situation acknowledge that Capital's primary error was a failure to, to sufficiently vet that some previous works, not to mention the character and company's ownership, before embarking on the project. They also noted the relatively new nature of the deal structure. While AI and TikTok have been prominent topics in the music industry for years, deals such as the one Capital struck with FN Mecca's creators last year are hardly standard. Both Factory yeah. New co-founder Anthony Martini and a representative for Capital confirmed that no money was advanced, that's interesting, that would largely render moot calls for a redistribution of any money generated by the project or paid by Capital to Factory. That's now, interesting. All, no that advance. Is interesting. 
No, exactly. Although it presumably did generate a certain amount of income in the 12 days it was oh, available on streaming services. So there's sure. a little bit of money there. Um, but it's an interesting point. You know, it, it's... Um, you know how how are these deals are these are not artists yeah I if mean, it's not they, a real person but let's not forget there's real people behind absolutely. these things and i think what really complicates this is that um this company factory new um is is being um approached by this houston based rapper this guy named Kyle the hooligan and he posted on instagram that uh, he wasn't paid for his work, that he voiced some of the FN Mecca vocals. He said that basically they came to me with all this AI shit and asked, would I want to be the voice of it? I thought it was going to be a collaboration. They promised me equity in the company, percentages, all this stuff. Next thing I know is that they ghosted me. You know, they used my voice, they used my sound, they used my culture, and literally left me high and dry. I didn't get a dime off nothing. And they got record deals. So it's a different kind of deal. No advance. Um, some of these, even though it's AI generated, you know, the the artist, you know, just like animated, um, there are real people, you know, behind kind of pulling these strings. Yeah, boy. I mean, obviously, we're going to see more of this. But boy, it, it was it. What a mess. What a mess. And yeah. Um, but again, the whole, oof, I, don't, I mean, I totally understand, listen, Capital is owned by Universal. Universal is now a public company. I didn't understand the money thing. Um, and you got to follow these things. But, but it's, it's so tempting and it's so hard to ignore something that has a billion views and 10 million followers on TikTok. Right there. What more do you need to know why right. people are, why labels are contemplating these things? Right, that says it all. You know, yeah, maybe. And and it, you know, the obvious. We were talking about the challenge of management and and managing personalities. Well, this is really easy. You know, it's it's an AI <laughs> artist, if you can yeah. call it that. So you know, there's, uh, but it's just a slippery slope. And right. But really I think the bottom line, and just weird. just to put a fine point on this, is that they wouldn't have that many views and listens if if the music wasn't compelling, if it wasn't good and whether your artist is AI uh, or, or a real human being, if you've got real people behind the scenes creating compelling music, that's the bottom line. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. So maybe I shouldn't even consider the AI thing, but I, but I do, <laughs> I'm sorry, but anyway, yeah, it, yeah. it's, it is the new music business, Jay, and that's what we talk about. And so we have to do these yeah. things. So big, yeah. big thanks to Jim on that particular piece. Yeah. Very well reported on. And uh, so there'll be further conversations about this stuff. in the Absolutely. Future, and what a crazy and amazing week uh, for us. You know, the conversation with Jonathan Daniel, you and I having oh, yeah. brunch with Shirley Halpern from Variety and just all these great stories this week. You know, the, the Ted Joya thing, we're going to be talking about that a lot because we've been watching these songs just get shorter and shorter and shorter, and we'll see if it's cyclical or not. So, uh, yeah, really crazy week. It was. It was. But fun. Yeah. <laughs> but fun and informative. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we do want to thank Banzugo, Hypebot, and Bands in Town for helping us put the show together. Wonderful sponsors that we have and wonderful listeners. So thank you, everyone, for listening to the show. We, Jay and I, uh, super appreciate it and are, uh, never forget it. And don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter if you have not. I assume most of you have. But if you haven't, jump on over to yourmorning.coffee and subscribe. And on that note, we will wrap up episode 107. Thanks for listening, everyone. We appreciate it. Have a great week, and we will see you next time on the Your Morning Coffee Podcast. You've been listening to Your Morning Coffee, the weekly music news program for the new music business. Join Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchard next time for the digital music news you need to know. 